From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers insiders Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right, welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. Politi Fonseca here. We're giving Lenny some more time after his paternity leave. Get back on his feet. Hey, it's not just the Rutgers Rant, Brian. This is the... Uh, second best audio, according to the New Jersey Press Association. Second place for best audio. And how does it feel to work on what is the second best audio in New Jersey? How do you feel about that? Well, I feel great as the audio engineer, the sound producer, whatever mm-hmm. pretentious title I want to give myself. I'm honored. Uh, mm-hmm. And I just want to tell everyone from the bottom of my heart, if you told me that I sound like I'm talking in a tin can, well, go take a walk, pal. Go kick rocks. Because this is an award-winning tin can. <laughs> I do love that the category is best audio. Because if there's something we're known for, it is our sound quality. That is one thing we take we take very seriously here at the Rutgers Rant. Uh, second place behind Matt Stammeyer's excellent podcast called Lights Out. If you haven't listened to it, it really is great. And unlike us, put a lot of time and resources into it. So keep that in mind. That's why we're second place. If we had the NIL, if we had... The payroll that he had. We have the same podcast, let's be honest. And you got to think that the referees of this you know, this contest were a little on the side of the lights yeah, out, the pretension, totally. no and question. the underdog Rutgers rant. Yeah, no question. Yeah, someone also said, someone also <laughs> tweeted back at me. Uh, are you sure there was more than two entries? No, we're not sure. Okay, smart ass, we're not sure. And that's okay. Second place counts. Even in a race with two. All right. That's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Rutgers athletics. Although, after uh, yesterday's game, might not be a lot of people wanting to talk about that either. A uh, disheartening 63 46 loss to Maryland. You know, I, I, I don't know what you say about this offense. It's funny. We're, as we're trying to come up with what we're going to write after these games, we kind of huddle, huddle up. And I just, I, I just said to Brian, like, I can't write another column on how bad this offense is. And it's funny. I went back and looked at it. And it was almost a year to the day that Rutgers scored 45 in a home game to Michigan. And it's like, all right, well, this, you know, different team, different personnel, somewhat, you know, same result. Uh, And in in a lot of ways, Brian, if you look at last year's team, we thought that was a really bad offense. It was nowhere near as bad as this one. And, you know, they took a big step back to get even worse. Uh, It's just hard to watch, you know, an 11 and a half minute drought. Where do you begin? Where do you even begin with that? Yeah, I don't remember ever seeing anything like that. And as you as you've touched on, we've watched a lot of bad offensive basketball covering Rutgers over the years. It probably does feel like some sort of a snowball thing. I'm sure Maryland's defense gets more confident as every shot misses, and Rutgers' def- uh, offense gets more you know dejected every time they miss. But they just were not getting good looks. They weren't able to finish the shots they were taking. They were turning the ball over a lot. They weren't even hitting their free throws. That was a big emphasis from Steve Peichel. They it missed was. the front end of three different one and ones at the end of the first half. And things just kind of snowballed, but it is a microcosm of how much they've struggled offensively, and it's kind of a microcosm of how teams have caught up to the Jeremiah Williams magic. Uh, seven games in, things are not looking as great as they were in the beginning, and you know I think Steve Peichel alluded to this too. Like teams are figuring out what he does well, what they have to take away, and what they have to force Rutgers to do. It was just really hard to watch. And even when they had a pretty decent finish, right? Like they were, they hit like something like seven baskets in the span of eight attempts in the second mm-hmm. half. They finished with 47 points. That's yeah. 18 points in the first half, Steve. 18 points. Like yeah. I've seen high school games with no shot clock that with more points in the first half. It's, yeah. it's just brutal to watch and it's impossible to win games like that. Right. And, and it looked like Steve Peichel and, and- I, and it's, it's the stat that just jumped up the page to me. You score 46 points and you've got 10 guys who score, <laughs> which is just like, well, all right. So Steve Peichel is trying to anything he could. Some really interesting decisions personnel wise. You know, if you look at the box score first, you know, Mawat Mag disappeared for a big stretch of the game, 18 minutes. But then, I mean, Cliff, only 17 minutes in the game. And, and he went to the smaller lineup because it was going to give him a quote unquote spark. Well, what happens when you do that is you just give up every single rebound because the guards aren't rebounding well. And then so Maryland not only dominated on the boards, but dominated physically inside. Uh, and and they couldn't defend Maryland's bigs when they switched to that lineup. I mean, there's just no good answer. And I'm not – it's just it, – it's the fact that Steve Peichel is still searching for his rotation on February 25th is damning. 
just means that there's not enough talent and there's not enough, you know, there's not enough good players on this team to to work, right? That's just the reality of it. Uh, Cliff was dealing with foul trouble, so that was part of the deal. But I figure, you know, he, he got his third foul something like 14 minutes to go. And by the time it made sense to bring him back in, the game was over, right? So I don't even know if it's worth putting Cliff back out there. You're kind of just rolling up the white flag when you throw out Oscar Palmquist at center. And in his defense, he had a couple of nice plays, the wackiest and one I've ever seen in my life. That was amazing. Um, yeah. Was. Some some and one, uh, sorry, some a charge that was really getting the crowd into it. He flexed to the student section and you kind of felt like a run was coming. Like I might, I don't know if you remember, like I, I was starting to sweat a little bit that I had to rewrite my game story, which was yeah. written at that point. Um, but obviously Austin Williams gets that technical foul. A lot of techs in the last couple games, uh, it's just a bit strange, but it's a technical foul. Maryland goes on a 7-0 run and things kind of close from there. I don't think they win the game anyway. But that certainly felt like uh, the shutting of the door. Yeah, I and I, I hated all of, all of the technical fouls. I hated. I don't. I don't quite get it. I know you don't want you know players talking trash at each other, but I mean, come on, you got to let a guy say. You got to let a guy show some emotion in the heat in the heat of, of the game. I, I, the first one I thought was bad, and it was it was amazing though. And also the first one was on uh, when Maryland was hit with the tech. It, it ended the scoring drought. That was the only way Rutgers could get points on the board or two free throws uh, after that tech. I mean, I don't know what Austin Williams did. I, I guess after the game, they talked about it a little bit, Brian. It wasn't really, they they, they kind of seemed perplexed by it as well. Right. So the, the Mawat Mag one makes sense. That was a bit of a scuffle at the end of a play. He shoved someone. I didn't see it at the time, but okay. Yeah. It was a weird play because yeah. it looked like Jermichael Davis got fouled at midcourt. They kept going for some reason. Someone blocked a shot. There was a bit of a skirmish and it, apparently Mawat Mag was the guy that shoved the guy. And he sat for 13 minutes after that tech. Steve Peichel said it was about keeping the momentum going. And But I, I got to think it's between a combination of his leg soreness kind of bothering him, not wanting to push him there because the game is over at that point, and to kind of send a message of like, you're a veteran on this team. You're one of the best players on this team. You can't be going around shoving people. But to that extends me to the other technical where you mentioned it perfectly. This game looked like an MMA match, like just constant punching and not, uh, sorry, constant physical play. And things were getting really heated with Rutgers coming back. The building was about to explode. Things were getting really, tensions were getting really high. And I think that as the ref, you got to try to control things and throwing mm -hmm. that tech kind of throw some water on the situation. Because if Rutgers gets that block, they get a steal, they go on the other end, they score, they're only down eight. That place is boiling. Yep. Some crazy thing could happen. You never know where emotions take a team, right? So I think I, I don't like it either. I think you you should be allowed to say get that shit out of there. I think it's a perfectly fine thing to say on a basketball court, but I can understand in the situation you want to kind of just slow everything down because things were starting to get a little a little heated. As for the effort part, you mentioned Oscar. Uh, he, again, he was the one guy who showed a little heart, some passion, drew a charge, tried to fire up the crowd. Uh, I would love to have seen a fired up Steve Peichel. Right. And, and but that's just not who he is. That's not what we're going to get. I guess, he, you know, there he, he was he was a little more animated in some of the huddles. But clearly, and this is I, I don't think I've ever heard him say it. Some, and of course, it, it's Steve Peichel. So he didn't come out and trash his team. But he was clearly unhappy with uh, that part of the game in the first half. Right. I mean, he, he didn't like the way his team came out and played. He didn't like the effort. He didn't like um you know, and and I wonder, I mean, I just wonder if he has reached the point of the season where he's kind of tired of this team too, right? I mean, I just, it, it just it occurred to me at some point that, you know, if you put, if you hooked him up to a lie detector test, what would he, how would he answer that question? Yeah, look, I, again, I, I know effort is obviously a very common thing we talk about. I think effort is always just an easy cop out for the fact that they don't have enough talent and they don't, are making shots. And when you're not making shots, it could obviously be frustrating on the defensive end. Maybe you give in a little bit less of an effort than usual, but the bigger issue than effort and want to and all these intangibles we like to think that the issue is they just don't have enough talent. They don't have enough shot makers. They don't have enough shot creators. They don't have enough offensive um, movement, offensive ideas, offensive whatever. Like the offense is clearly struggling and that brings everything down. Um, I think Steve Peichel is very clearly frustrated. I think he realizes this is not worth. This is not a team that's worth exploding over because I think they are trying the best they can. I don't think this is a team that's has a bunch of hidden potential that they're not unlocking because they're not mm -hmm. trying hard enough. I think they're trying very hard, and between a combination of injuries, a combination of lack of talent, it just has not worked out. Right. Well, and it's going to be interesting because I think finally next year we're going to have the answer to: is it the talent, offensive talent, or is it 
the offensive coaching because next year they're going to have two very talented offensive players. I think we know that now with Ace Bailey and Dylan Harper, two different off two different kinds of offensive players. If this team is near the bottom in the Big Ten and scoring again, then next year there's something wrong, right? I mean this 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 has to be the time where we see like a real creative, uh, real structured offense built around two freshmen, but two great college, potentially great college players. Yes. I don't think they're going to become a team that does a bunch of interesting things. They're not going to become a BYU that does like, you know, some wizardry on the basketball court. But I do think you're going to have a lot more weapons to work with. And that opens some things up. And a lot of the actions they run this year will look a lot better with Ace Bailey being the guy taking the shot than, Mm -hmm. you know, insert anyone you want to insert. Right. Uh, I think it, your point is very valid. I think it will be a major test because if Steve Peichel can't and his, I shouldn't say this, Steve Peichel and his coaching staff can't get a team with two surefire NBA players with elite offensive talent that I've seen with my own two eyes. If you can't get them to be at worst, a middle of the pack, big 10 team in offensive oh, efficiency. Yeah. I think, listen, I don't think they're going to leave the big 10 in scoring. I, I don't think that's even fair. Right. That's not their style. That's fine. They have to I be, agree. At the very least, a competent offensive team. And if you can't do that with two surefire NBA guys, I just don't think you're ever going to be able to do it. Right, right. Uh, and there's a lot. And this I, I've written this a couple times now, mentioned in my column this morning, that I think this season puts so much more pressure on next season. You know, both from uh, delivering for the fan standpoint, for Steve Peichel, for for everything, for the program, for the tra- trajectory, for the future of it. It's just, it just could not be more. It was already going to be the most anticipated season in 25 years at Rutgers, you know, now you've got, you know, you're adding on the dimension of what's likely to be a postseason uh, no show, like on top of that. So it's just, I mean, that that's the, uh, that's the hidden part of this season for me is that you're just heaping on more and more, more and more, more pressure on next year. Yes. Yes. It, Steve Weigel has gotten a lot of leeway because of the situation he took over. Obviously Rutgers was, if not the worst, one of the worst high major programs in the country. They had not made a tournament for 30 years. We all know the history. But next year will be his ninth season. And in his first eight years, he will have two NCAA tournament appearances and one NCAA tournament win. That is fine through eight years, through rebuild, through all that. Once mm-hmm. you have two NBA players, once you do all the work on the recruiting trail to get talent that is far superior to anything you've ever had, you have to pull through. You have to at the very least, win a game. At the very least, come close to making it to the Sweet Sweet 16. If you don't make it to the second weekend, you have to just lose a game that you're vastly outplayed. You have to, more important than anything, make the tournament without reaching this point of the season next year and wondering if they're going to make the tournament at all. That should not be a bubble team next year. That is the biggest thing. You cannot be a bubble team. You have to be in in the field, playing for seeding, and competing to make a run to the second weekend. And make the most of what you have. Uh, because if you don't, then that's... I'm not saying he's on the hot seat after next year if he doesn't pull through with all that. But I do think a lot more scrutiny will come his way. Because he's been pretty protected as far as he's done a lot of great things for this program. And that's kind of shield him from some from a rough year like this year. After next year, if you don't pull through next year, then there will be some serious pressure to take the next step. What is the NIT for this year, what is the NIT forecast? Can they get there at three and one? Do they need to win? Will it matter if they win a game in, in Minneapolis? I mean, what is the general feeling on that? The NIT is in a weird year in that they're in a transition year. Uh, usually, the winner of every regular season league gets an automatic bid into the NIT and then it's at large things. This year, for fear of a Fox Sports tournament that's starting in Vegas next year, I believe it's still happening in Vegas next year, they've changed the format so that the top two teams in the net that don't make the NCAA tournament get an automatic bid to the NIT from all the power leagues. So in the Big Ten, let's say the six teams make the tournament. The next two teams in the net automatically get in, and then it's a bunch of at-large stuff. I think Rutgers is behind the pack on a few teams. Ohio State's second to last in the league. I think they're ahead of them from the bracketology stuff I've seen. Wow. I think they have some ground to make up. Uh, and Ohio State probably took another step forward. They beat Michigan State yesterday. They beat mm-hmm. Purdue last week. Um, so I think Rutgers has to, at the very least when it's two last home games against Ohio State and Michigan, preferably against Michigan by 100 points, just dominate a bad team. And you have to 
probably steal at least one of the road games against Wisconsin and Nebraska. Um, I do think the Big Ten tournament is irrelevant for this as much as it is for the NCAA tournament. Uh, I certainly think it would help if you reached, you know, the semifinal or whatever. I think that kind of boosts you. But uh, much like so, their margin for error for the NCAA tournament is is literally non-existent. They have to win the Big Ten tournament. Their margin for error for the NIT is pretty thin at this point too. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot to, to give me a hope there a lot for the last three games that they're going to do what you said they need to do. It just seems like this this season's going to end in Minneapolis, but we shall see. All right. At this point, uh, do you even want do you even want to make the NIT? Yeah, you're... I think so. Yeah, I if, absolutely because you still have you still have some young guys who can gain experience from that, and who knows? I mean, it's it's not beyond the realm of possibility. It's still that we talk about they don't have a lot of talent, but they still they have NIT talent for goodness sakes. Yeah, I think you absolutely want to make the NIT. Why? What, what is your case against it? My devil's advocate case against it is the season ends. The earlier the season ends, the earlier you could start to plan for next year. The earlier you could start to identify uh, you know, potential spots in the in the roster you have to upgrade. You can have conversations with players about what they're going to do, so you can have an idea of how the roster is shaking out, and you can kind of just plan for when the portal opens. This is why Ohio State fired their coach in mid-February and didn't wait till the end of the year. Now you can kind of have everything planned for you. Bring a coach in place, and that coach can get his plan prepared. Uh, that's my case against it. Now, I don't know how much that will factor for them. I I just don't know how much they want to play, right? Like it, it, when Jeremiah Williams was leading them to four straight wins, it felt like that was a team that could make a run in the NIT and that's beneficial. I just don't see why getting to the NIT now, maybe losing in the first or second round in you know unceremonious way. I just don't know what the benefit to that is. And I don't think, as, as you mentioned at the top of the pod, I don't think fans are very engaged at this point. I just don't know if, yeah. you know, a first round game in the NIT against Villanova will really get the juices flowing. You just Googled it and, and, deter- and, and figured out that the NIT finals are not in Las Vegas. And that's, and that's where this is coming from. That's my theory. Well, I found out it was in Indianapolis this year and not mm-hmm. Las Vegas recently. Um, right. But no, mm-hmm. that is not why I changed my mind. Because yes. frankly, frankly, I don't think this team is good enough to make it to the semifinals of the NIT. So it's kind of a moot point. Shrimp cocktail. All right. Uh, let's do some comments, questions from our insiders. Everyone, thank you for firing them off. It seems like there was just kind of a, uh, bit of a air coming out of the balloon here in our Rutgers insider comments, but we'll go through some of them here. Uh, here's one. If Pico Fer- fails to land a big, sh- a big and a shooter in the portal, and we are one and done the NCAAs next season, can we fire him? We've been on a slow and steady decline since the Jacob Young led team in 20. 20- 21. Well, you knew this stuff was going to come, right? You knew this was there were going to be questions like this. Um, short answer, no. They're not going to fire Steve Peichel. They shouldn't fire Steve Peichel. This is still Rutgers. I mean, I, I don't know. I, at what point does he move to the hot seat? That's a good question. I think you're still several years away from that as long as Pat Hobbs is the athletic director, that there's no one in, right now in college basketball who's on a more stable seat than Steve Peichel right now at this moment. It's fascinating that in this three game losing streak, no one's tweeted that story you tweeted out a month ago, that column at you. It's, it's, it, you know, everyone was tweeting it under the sun was tweeting at you after that four game win streak. And now all of a sudden everyone's gotten kind of quiet. I don't know what happened. I, um, yeah. It's funny how the, those things kind of work. Uh, right. what I would say and it's that, funny because they got those, those guys got it wrong too. They're like, everyone's like, well, we're you know, going to apologize for saying Peichel should be fired. Folks, <laughs> like there's find someone go and find those words under a story that I wrote. Never said that. Of course not. That's stupid. But he can't be criticized. And I think we're seeing, yeah, this has been a, this he's 14 and 13, 6 and 10 in the Big Ten. I mean, I get it. It's not he's not not running the program where you can't, you know, it's not like Kentucky where you can't have a year like this, but I mean, you, you, you can get criticized when you do. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you should lose your job over it. Steve Peichel's built this program. Everyone knows what he's done here. But man, yeah. Anyway, you that you was off wrote topic. in that story. You wrote literally in that story. He should not be on the hot seat. You should not be <laughs> within a, a you know a hundred miles of the hot seat. But people choose to not read that. They read the tweet anyway. That's not the point. You're right. I don't think Steve Peichel will be on the hot seat anytime soon. I think he can miss the NCAA tournament next year, the year after, and two more years after that. And that's when people will maybe start thinking about it. He is in a situation where he's done enough that his job security is fine. But I do think if they are one and done in the NCAA tournament next year, 
serious questions will be asked about the ceiling of the program under him. Mm -hmm. And I think those are totally yep. fair. And that depends also on where the 2025 class is, right? You have to hope that this next year, you take the talent you have, you have a good regular season, you compete for a Big Ten title, you get a high bid in the high seed in the NCAA tournament, you make a bit of a run, even if it's not a Final Four run, you make a second weekend run that's very positive, and you parlay that into a 2025 recruiting class that's strong, not top five in the country strong, but strong, and you kind of just build on that, and you take those steps forward. These things aren't linear, obviously, as we can tell from this year, things have been kind of in a steady decline, but I do think if you don't take advantage of what's in front of you next year, serious, serious questions will and should be asked about how far this program can go under its current leadership. So much is riding on next year. Totally agree. All right. Uh, another question about not Steve Peichel, but how much of this historically bad offense is the player's fault versus the coach's fault? Is it time to shake up the coaching staff? That to me is more uh, of a viable question to ask um, than Steve Peichel's future. I thought when they were making the hire last year that it would have been it would have been wise to bring in someone who was your offensive guru. This is kind of what I thought the job could be. Steve Peichel went in a direction um, and a smart direction, you know, as far as recruiting goes, brought in another excellent recruiter. I understand that. Um, yeah. I mean, I wonder if you, you bring back a Jay Young, if there's someone you can bring in, in, in a, in a role that can craft this offense. I, I, I think that is a really good um, smart way of looking at this in, in the off season. You agree? I think it is the coach's fault insofar as they recruited these players. I'm not going to blame a bad player for pl playing poorly if he's not supposed to be playing on the stage. That's kind of where I sit on this. Steve Peichel has had three offenses ranked in the top 100 in Ken Palm's offensive efficiency in the past for a three-year stretch from 2019-20 until 2021-2022. That's three years of not great, but decent offense. And in mm -hmm. that stretch, he had good offensive players. He had Ron Harper Jr. He had Jacob Young. He had Cam Spencer. He had players can produce. So I think next year, again, will be a big tell of what they can do with talented offense. I don't think if you brought in, the, name me right now the greatest offensive basketball coach of all time. You brought them in and told them to coach this team for a year. This team is not, I mean, maybe they won't be 300th nationally in offensive efficiency, I'm not convinced they'll be much better than they are now. Mm -hmm. I, I th the, the X's and O's could be better. Absolutely. I'm not denying that. What I'm saying is I'm not sure that the pieces to put those X's and O's in are good enough to do much better than they are now. All right. We got a bunch of questions on Cliff and rebounding. No rebounding. What has happened to Cliff the last few games? Why did they bench Cliff 17 minutes? What is he thinking? Uh, I don't think foul trouble explains all of it. I really don't. I mean, I get it. They, he did have some foul trouble, three fouls. I mean, I, I just think that Steve Peichel saw something there that it was just not, it, it, I don't I don't know what it was, um, that he was willing to give up uh, rebounding and and defense in the paint for something else. It didn't work, but I mean, you disagree with that, that that was, that was not, that was not an intentional decision to leave him on the bench? I'm not in his head. I don't know. I do know that they had gone 11 minutes without scoring a basket. You kind of, at that point, throw up your hands and just do whatever you can to fix the issue because whatever was on the court was not working. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I I don't know. I don't know if it if it's a particularly, you know, revealing decision on, you know, the future. I don't know if he's punishing him for something or sending a message. I have no idea. Uh, I just think the Occam's razor of this is he had – Two fouls with five minutes to go in the first half, so he sat him. He had three fouls with 14 minutes to go or something like that, so he sat him. And by the time it was time to bring him back on the court, they were losing by 20 points, and he thought, let me not play my center in a meaningless game and uh, protect him. Quite possible. All right, we had some Ace and Dylan questions. By the way, we haven't talked about it, but you saw <laughs> you saw a, you saw a Dylan Harper um, at City Field. It's like a lot of strange things. At City Field with... Tom Brady. Um, tell us that story because that's uh, kind of odd, right? I mean, just just a weird combination. Then yes. neither one of them played baseball. Not like they're, you know, like they're like they're like they're similar type athletes. I mean, it's just strange. Well, Tom Brady could have gotten drafted. I think he got drafted by the Expos back uh, back in the day, so he could have played baseball. Uh, Dylan Harper does not play baseball, so I think we're good there. 
Um, so it was at Ebb's restaurant at City Field. It was a Tops event. Fanatics owns Tops. Um, I don't know why it was there. That's a bizarre place to to do it. Uh, but yes, so Tom Brady is a Fanatics athlete, as is Dylan Harper. And I got an email during the second half of the Purdue game. Rutgers is losing by 30 points or whatever. And I got an email in my inbox. Invite Tom Brady and Dylan Harper. And I'm like, what is this? Is this? Am I getting trolled or something? <laughs> and uh, so it worked out. I was covering the Seton Hall game on Saturday night for our colleague Adam Zagoria, who was in Virginia watching his daughter compete for Davidson. Uh, she's a track athlete in the A-10 championships. Congratulations to Grace Zagoria. I believe she set a personal record in her uh, competition. Outstanding. Anyway, besides the point. Very happy for Adam. Good dude. Uh, but I had done enough time because of the, the timing of the event and the Seton Hall game being at 8.30 on a Saturday. What are these TV execs doing? Anyway, um, so I head over to City Field, which is a, just an absolute minefield to get to. Driving in New York City is just an abomination, and I hate doing it every time I do it. Long story short, I get to the event. Dylan Harper's in the back. He's uh, talking to some people, and he's waiting for Tom Brady to walk in through the back door. And I just talked to him beforehand. I'm like, uh, you know, man, have you ever met Tom Brady? No, I haven't met Tom Brady. You've met a lot of famous people in your life. You know, this is the son of a five-time NBA champion who played with Michael Jordan, who played with Kobe Bryant. He met, He's met LeBron. He's worked out with Steph Curry. I'm like, where does Tom Brady kind of sit on that? He's like, oh, top three. Top three, no doubt. No doubt. I might get a little star starstruck if I'm being honest with you. And uh, I, when I've asked him about Tom Brady, I don't think I've ever seen him smile the way I have. So he was obviously very excited for this. Um, and Tom Brady comes in. I'm about five feet from Tom Brady. And you see this guy in photos, and he has like this very defined face. And you're like, this mm. is probably a little bit of Photoshop. Just unbelievable. The most defined face I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, it, it's incredible. Like, the, the I, can't, I can't begin to explain how not like a human he's being a, looked. He's a handsome man. Okay, move on. We got I'm not it. trying to say he's handsome. I'm trying to say like he didn't look human to me. Like it was insane. Uh and so they rush him onto the field, uh, onto the, the stage, because he's a little bit late. Uh he's flown in private to LaGuardia and drove in. He got the same traffic I did. So uh don't blame him there. And uh he was supposed to take a photo with Dylan Harper in the back. A bit of a confusion in the procedure because of them scrambling happened. And then uh the people at Fanatics just say, Hey, don't let's just get Dylan on stage. So they say, hey, Tom, this is Dylan Harper. You met Dylan, right? This is the number two prospect in high school basketball. He's going to Rutgers. And he's like, oh, you're a big boy. The Big Ten, huh? That's great. That's amazing. Congratulations. They hand out some cards together. Dylan's kind of like understandably in a weird situation because Tom Brady is like working the mic like a pro. <laughs> and then there's a hundred screaming children right in front of him throwing their cards in his face. And like, and then Tom heads out of the event, kind of scrambling back to get to his private jet. And him and Dylan have a quick embrace afterwards. They take a photo together. Tom Brady wishes him good luck. Take care. They say goodbye and they go on their merry way. And Dylan is smiling ear to ear that he got to meet uh, Tom Brady. So uh, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I would have ever seen that collaboration in my life. Uh, right. but it yeah. was cool. It was cool to be there. There's so many things. There's so many things about this. This the, everything that happens next year. Everything has happened since. Like even his commitment, his announcement that was unprecedented in Rutgers. I mean, now this like it, it just there's so many little moments that you go, wait, what? Wait, what? He's you know, this is a reminder that that he's going to Rutgers. It's just kind of like yeah, and this is one of them. So that yeah, it's amazing. That's a great story. Tom Brady can maybe he can get maybe he can get Brady. This you should have stopped. John Newman should have been there to stop Brady and say, hey, look. This is a good NIL opportunity. Where, where was the where was the NIL people to get Tom Brady aboard? I could barely get Tom Brady to stop. I was just shocked. Tom Brady remembered that Rutgers was in the Big Ten. Right. Missed opportunity, <laughs> but you didn't you didn't interview Tom Brady. You couldn't like jump in front of his his rental car. I drive with him to Laguardia. Come on, I could have. I don't know who he was with. He's Tom Brady, man. What, what if he He's had Tom personal Brady. security? There were security he guards there did. for fanatics, and they were yeah. some. Big dudes, talk about big boys. Those were some big right. boys that I was not getting in front of, man. I, as much as I love a quick quote about Dylan Harper from Tom Brady, I was not going to sacrifice my life to do it. So, right. And then Dylan gave you a great quote that you gave to me, which I appreciate from my column about uh, players saying, "Can you get here now?" I mean, a fan saying to him, "Can you get here now? Can you get here now?" And so that was that was good stuff. It was uh, a throwaway so Dylan, question. Yeah, it was, it was a throwaway yeah. question because I was I I was asking questions about like. You're a 17 year old kid, and everywhere you go, you know, there's people wanting to get your autograph and take photos and all this. And after he answered, I was like, So fans were hounding you for months, like, commit to Rutgers, come to Rutgers, this and that. What do they say to you now that you committed? And they're like, Man, they say, like, We need you. We wish you could put on a Rutgers uniform right now and suit up. And I tell him, you know, like, essentially that it's coming soon and he's excited, but he's got to win a state championship for Don Bosco first. Bosco state championship first, which he hasn't done yet, right? He hasn't won one. 
So. Right. That's the one thing that Ron Harper always holds above his head. He has two state titles. Dylan has zero, and Dylan's going to try to close the gap in his last chance. Uh, his first game is today, actually. So they're hoping to uh, – today's the start of a championship journey. I think if he makes it to the title game, they will play at Rutgers, which should be interesting to watch. There you go. Something. <laughs> so there will there will be meaningful basketball at the rack after all in March. There you go. All right. Let's see. What other questions we have? We had people asking about – uh, whether or not if there any indication that Harper and Bailey are having commitment, second thoughts. No, they're coming. They're coming. Uh, so we can address that quickly. Here's a good one. There's a question because this ended up Jerry Carino tweeted this uh, little exchange at the end of the game between Kevin Willard and our Brian Fonseca. So the question is, what did Fonseca get at Catherine Lombardi's on Valentine's Day? So this is a, this is a great story um, to set the scene. Kevin Willard, who's still knows a lot of people um, in the New Jersey media and <laughs> unlike me actually likes a few of them. Um, Jerry Carino, especially. So he gets off the podium. He's done. He says, hey, Jerry, Jerry, I had a great Italian, I had a great Italian meal. He goes, oh, Jerry, of course, Jerry's very Italian. He's like, well, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Uh, and, and, and Willard's like, oh, someplace near the hotel in New Brunswick. I, I, I can't, I, he couldn't come up with it. And Brian sitting a row back goes, Catherine Lombardi's. And Willard's <laughs> eyes open wide. He goes, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's the restaurant. And then Brian volunteers that he took his girlfriend there for Valentine's Day. And Willard, I mean, this is just a great line. Goes, wow, it's an expensive place. You must be doing pretty well. <laughs> I love it. I'm very hopeful my bosses didn't hear that exchange because I'm not doing that well. I could do be. I could be doing a lot better. You must be doing pretty well. I, I wish I came up with that line. Uh, when Willard said it, I was kind he was of very show. impressed. He, Kevin Willard was like, "Oh, the, the, eyes wide open. Okay, look at this kid coming out here with Catherine Lombardi's for what did you have? Tell me about your meal at Catherine Lombardi. I'm curious now too." Okay, so it was half a fib, right? So Catherine Lombardi's and Stage Left Steakhouse are owned by the same thing and have the same kitchen, right? So in theory, I could have ordered from Catherine Lombardi's, but I was on the mm -hmm. Stage Left side. I got a steak, I got a little filet mignon, got a little oh, bit of that. fries, you know. Uh, my girlfriend's from the Midwest, so we got a nice slab of bacon as a side, uh, and we had um, a bisque. Uh, uh, it wasn't a lobster bisque. It was like a tomato bisque. Uh, I thought it was a nice meal. Certainly, it was not as nice as whatever Kevin had. I'm sure he got the most expensive wine. We got the uh, the house wine, so it's not. Uh, I'm not doing that well, Kevin. Kevin's only making about three to four million more dollars than I am, but uh, who's counting? No, but as far as he's concerned, you guys are peers. Now he walked out of that going, "How about that guy?" I hope I got some shriek cred in the next Big Ten coaches meeting. Absolutely. He call could, Steve, like Steve, this is this guy, this Fonseca guy, is getting some real good Italian food downtown. He's got some, re he got some restaurant recommendations across the Big Ten. That's great. All right, a good little moment there. It was expensive, um, by the way. It was very expensive. So he's not wrong there. <laughs> hey, come on, for Valentine's Day, you gotta go. You gotta go out sometimes, right? Well, I, I, I did not second guess my decision until Kevin Willard told me it was expensive, and I started thinking, huh, it was pretty expensive. So. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's wonderful. All right. What else do we got? We got a lot of what else, right? There's a lot of other things to talk about here at the end of the podcast. Track, lacrosse. Where do you want to begin? Let's start with the uh the best. Uh women's track won three Big Ten championships at the indoor championships this weekend. Alex Carlson won a gold medal in the mile. Uh Chloe Timberg won a gold medal, I believe, in pole vault, and she is pound for pound, maybe the best athlete at Rutgers. Uh, just very impressive career at Rutgers. Sorry, Alex Carlson won two gold medals. She won the gold medal in the 3,000 mi uh, 3, not mile, not 3,000 mile, 3,000 meter and uh, the mile. And Celine Jada Brown won the gold medal in the women's long jump. Nice. So that, that's three gold medalists, four gold medals, and Rutgers finished in seventh place, which is their best team finish in program history at the Big Ten Indoor Championships. The program has steadily been climbing since it joined the Big Ten. I think this is a very positive weekend for them. And it's a sport we don't really pay much attention to, so it's good to give them a little bit of shine uh, when they have a pretty big weekend like this. Absolutely. Congratulations. Men's Lax destroyed Loyola, Maryland. Uh, okay. It was 2-1 on the season. So they rebound from their loss last weekend to Army and get a pretty big win. Uh, baseball is off to a 5-1 and one start. They yeah. swept Winthrop. They almost swept Old Dominion. Fell short on the last game. Uh, but still, a pretty good start to the year. Wrestling Maryland? had their last meet of the season against Bloomberg or Bloomfield Bloomberg. Okay. or Bloom, Bloom something. Bloomfield. Let me get it right. Let me look it up. 
but now I'm confused with Michael Bloomberg, who I don't think wrestled last night. So <laughs> he's what he's a one twenty five pounder. <laughs> They defeated Bloomsburg on senior night. It was Bloomsburg. Yes. The last meet of the year before the Big Ten mm-hmm. Championships in a couple weeks. And another quick Rutgers basketball related thing Jonathan Gavoni of ESPN dropped his first 2025 mock draft for the NBA this morning. Let's play a game, Steve. Where do you think Ace Bailey and Dylan Harper were picked in this uh, inaugural mock draft from the leading expert in the field? I'm going to go Ace Bailey two, Dylan Harper six. How's that? You read the story. Is that exactly right? Did you read the story? No, I did not. No. You, you nailed it. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. Yes. No hesitation either. Oh, man. How about that? I didn't read it. Yeah. So it's uh, Cooper Flag number one to the Washington Wizards. Ace Bailey number two to the Charlotte Hornets. Mm. Um, Kaman Malouk, a big man who was projected to go to Duke at number three. Uh, Jalil Bethea, a, a Philadelphia native that Rutgers recruited for a while before he committed to Miami at four to the Bulls. Hugo Gonzalez from Real Madrid at Ooh. number five to the Spurs. And number six, Dylan Harper from Rutgers to the Detroit Pistons. And uh, last thing, women's across 4 0, ranked number 24 in the country. Good start. Melissa Lemons had that program on the rise. And obviously, with a 4 0 start and a top 25 ranking, it looks like they're on pace to have another strong spring. Who knows? Maybe make a run in the NCAA tournament. We'll see that down the road, but good start so far. Great job. All right. So stuff to look forward to in the spring, even if it's not NCAA basketball. Okay. Well, I don't know when we'll talk to you again. Probably uh, probably soon to recap some hoops season, perhaps the hoops season obituary podcast. I know you guys will be looking forward to that. But uh, until then, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.
Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.